All right, so we are right on time. It's 11 a.m. here in Minneapolis. Welcome everybody to today's uh, session, State Policies of Caregiving, Opportunities for Supporting Dementia Caregivers. So the development and implementation of caregiver programs and policies remains largely in the hands of state policymakers. And states have a variety of programs and initiatives available to them to support family caregivers, from training programs for caregivers to financial support to pay, paid family leave, et cetera. And the final policy landscape looks different in each state. So we couldn't possibly cover, cover all of these policy options today. So we have decided to focus on, um, on state respite policies. Um, and some of these other policy options might be topics of future webinars. Public health um, has an important role to play in the development of caregiving policies, whether it's by providing data on caregiving and health to influence funding priorities, or by identifying service gaps to inform and guide resource allocation across the state, or ensuring that a variety of culturally responsive programming is available and accessible to caregivers all across the state. So we hope that today's conversation with New York and Illinois will generate questions and spark ideas for your own work. Welcome, my name is Elma. I am the coordinator of the BOLD Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving, and I also coordinate our community engagement activities at the University of Minnesota Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation. Next slide. We, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. It's important to acknowledge the people on whose land we live, learn, and work in a physical and in this virtual space as we seek to improve and strengthen our own relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough, and our university is committed to providing support, resources, and programs that can increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, and community members. Next slide, please. Many of you, this is probably not the first uh, session for many of you, of, but just a brief introduction of our center. The purpose of our center is to build capacity of public health agencies to develop the support infrastructure for family caregivers of so people living with dementia in their jurisdiction, whether it's at the state or local level. We do that by improving access to evidence-based programs, by facilitating new connections between public health and a variety of other organizations serving people living with dementia and their caregivers, and by providing tailored technical assistance to public health agencies. Next slide. Our center is part of the HBI, Healthy Brain Initiative Collaborative, which is a group of national partners working together to fully integrate cognitive health into public health practice and improve brain health for all of us, especially for underserved populations. You can learn more about the HBI Collaborative if you scan this QR code or visit our website. Thank you. Before we begin, we um, just would like to start with a few reminders for today's session. This is a webinar format, so please submit your questions for the speakers into the Q&A feature in your Zoom. We will have time at the end of the session for, to answer all of the questions and for discussion. And use the chat to share comments or relevant resources, links, and ideas. The recording and the slides will be shared with everyone after the event within a few days. And um, please let us know how about your experience today. Scan this code, have it open on your phone, um, or um, it, the Zoom will invite you when you uh, leave this webinar to just answer a few questions about today's event and share ideas for the future. Thank you. Next slide, please. Before we begin, we would like to know in what capacity you are attending this event. So we will launch just a very quick poll and we invite you to please answer if you are here on behalf of a bold public health agency, a non-bold public health agency, community organization, if you are a person living with dementia, if you are a caregiver or a clinical care professional. Thank you. I see the responses coming in.
I will end it shortly when all have had a chance to respond and share the results with you. All right. You should be seeing the results on your screen. I apologize if you're not, but we're having, we have 34% community organizations and service providers here with us today, followed by bold public health agencies. Great showing today here. I'm so glad you all are here. Um, so, and we hope this is a good session. Next slide, please. Without further ado, I am going to hand it off to our um, facilitator today, Carter Harrison from the Alzheimer's Association. We will be joined by Jennifer Belkov and Jessica Link from Illinois and by Bill Gustafson and Katie Mahar from New York. Welcome to our speakers and Carter, take it off from here. Thank you, Alma. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is to go over some exciting uh, new ways to think about supporting caregivers of people living with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And what I hope um, we can do is to help get states thinking a little bit differently about how to address these populations and the needs uh, of these uh, individuals that are supporting people with dementia. So as we go through these, I, I hope you guys will think about questions you might have for us or ways that you can uh, challenge us to help you think about these issues differently going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so I wanna start off by talking a little bit about the, uh, the background for, for Alzheimer's caregivers. Next slide, please. And oh, back one. Um, and what I really want to focus on is the impact of Alzheimer's on the caregiving community. A lot of times we get asked questions about general caregiving programs versus dementia-specific caregiving programs and why a more generic program may or may not work for people living with Alzheimer's disease. And I want to sort of point out a couple of things. First, the size. Uh, there are about 11 million individuals that are providing unpaid care uh, to people with Alzheimer's disease, um, which uh, equates to about 350 billion in service that is provided by those caregivers. And the reason that that is important is it nearly matches the amount that the federal government um, and various state governments spend currently um, caring for this population. And uh, individuals that are providing care for people with Alzheimer's disease experience a huge amount of stress. Nearly 70% of them um, have a great deal of stress when it comes to coordinating or managing the caregiving needs. And again, this should not be surprising, but nearly half of them said that healthcare is difficult. I know personally, I live in this space and I still find navigating the healthcare system to be quite a challenge. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about caregiver needs, I like to think about it in two different buckets. So first we have the bucket that is the person living with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. And that person's needs are different than the caregiver's needs, but by addressing the caregiver's needs, we're able to help support the needs of the person living with dementia. So you know, things like ADL, activities of daily living, IADL um, activities of, uh, instrumental activities of daily living, um, probably are things that you think about on an everyday basis, but also there are issues around managing um, behavioral health issues that might come up from time to time, and they can vary in size and severity. Also, um, you know, there's a great deal of need around care management and finding the care and support that's necessary for individuals, arranging that care and support, making sure that people show up on time and the care is provided. Um, this is also uh, further complicated by other chronic conditions um, that need to be supported for those individuals. Uh, medication management, rather that's for their um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, or rather that is for their other chronic conditions. Um, and 
this is all sort of balanced with the needs to keep that individual into um, into the community that they're in currently and not move up the scale um, for more intensive supports, um, including institutional care. Next slide, please. Now, this is the slide that I think we should pay a little bit more attention to, and that is, what are the needs of the Alzheimer's caregivers? So the first need I think um, that we should really focus on is education. Um, most people do not know as much as we think they do about Alzheimer's, what's going to happen, how things are gonna play out in the future, um, which is why the second most important thing I think to these caregivers is planning. How can I plan for the future? What is that going to look like? What are the care needs going to, uh, that are going to be in place for the individual I'm caring for? Um, there's a lot of issues around planning that needs to be focused on and also maintaining sort of a normal self. When you put on the caregiver hat, it's easy to sort of be subsumed with that everyday activity that needs to be done um, starting, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night and running for the entirety of the day. So maintaining some sense of normalcy is very important to those caregivers. And also a little bit about who those caregivers are. So roughly two thirds of them are women um, and two thirds of them live with the person who has um, Alzheimer's or dementia. 25% of them are the sandwich generation. So they're caring for kids as well as possibly parents or, or in-laws. 40% um, of them have college degrees or higher. And um, around 10% are actually providing their care for spouses, which um, I know sometimes seems a little counterintuitive that you would think that number might be a little higher, but um, next slide, please. So given the size and complexity of the Alzheimer's population, um, it should not be a surprise that the federal government has decided to take some action. Next slide, please. And probably the biggest example that we have of this deals with the um, ACL uh, Lifespan Respite Care Program. Now, this program is not uh, necessarily um, sort of the uh, well, it's the, the federal government's response. They have been awarded 38 states since 2009, these grant programs. Um, there are some dementia-specific components around um, education, including uh, training and caregiver resources, um, especially most recently the nine steps to respite care for family uh, caregivers um, document that's been put out by this group. And these are all important resources. And as the lifespan respite program continues to adapt, um, it does do a better job of meeting some of these needs that we discussed earlier, because it's not just respite care, because that frankly can be some of the smallest components of this, but it also needs to provide um, services to address uh, the issues that are needed by caregivers. So rather that is, um, you know, additional training or additional education or um, ways to further address the needs. And also it has to build upon the resources that exist in the community. So whether or not that's um, new partners beyond the traditional partners or um, other ways of providing these types of additional services that go beyond respite. Next slide, please. So um, of course, as the federal government first um, puts these pieces out, the states in some cases are ahead and in some cases are following up, but um, they also want to address uh, some of these respite and other uh, caregiver support programs. So we have um, about 18 states that have approximately 108 million uh, appropriated in a variety of services that are designed uh, to support either respite or dementia caregivers. Um, in a lot of cases, these programs are very similar to the ACL program, um, and they provide the same types of, of services that cover uh, the cost of respite. 
Many of these use the traditional partners like AAAs or Aging and Disability Resources. Um, they also have a wide variety of financial criteria um, that can vary quite a bit um, across the states. And I think this is often very important because uh, some of the data we have from our facts and figures indicate that 41% of individual caregivers um, have an income of less than 50,000, um, which means that there are a large number of individuals that have uh, an income of $50,000 and $1 going up. Uh, so it makes, uh, wherever we have these lines, it makes access an issue. Um, and also a lot of these benefits uh, provide less than $1,000 in respite coverage. I like to think of an example from my home state in Virginia. While this program was not dementia specific, it uh, did provide respite grant coverage of $500. When it did so, um, the program was written so that it was prorated. So in the first year, it would be over um, too many people would apply and the grant would be reduced to around a couple of hundred dollars. And in the second year, uh, not enough people would apply. And so there would be funding left over just to sort of illustrate some of the issues with these respite coverage programs. Uh, next slide, please. So other area that the states have been addressing um, respite is in the, the Medicaid programs. Uh, these are often done through um, waivers and state plan amendments. Uh, generally, these are waivers that target um, the over 65 population or people with disabilities. Um, however, states have been um, very creative recently around using 1915I, J, K, or PACE programs uh, to adopt these. Um, and one example, and this is actually a, a 1915C waiver, is the Missouri um, Structured Family Caregiving Waiver which specifically provides um, care for individuals diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that program has been building out and of course has an alternate institutional placement of a nursing facility. So with that quick overview, next slide please. I would like to turn it over to Jessica Lint, Link in Illinois to talk about some of the programs that they've been doing uh, to further caregiver support in Illinois. Jessica. Thank you, Carter. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to the East Coast. I am Jessica Link, the Dementia Coordinator with the Illinois Department of Public Health, here with Jennifer Belko, the VP of Public Policy with the Alzheimer's Association Illinois Chapter. So on our first slide, you will see an overview of the caregiver programs and efforts in Illinois that we will tell you more about. And then also included here are the dollar amounts allocated to each area in case that's helpful. So the five different areas of funding policy and dementia caregiver efforts we'll tell you about are first, our community care program with 1.46 billion going out annually, um, dedicated family caregiver funding at our triple A's, which puts out 5 million annually, a state funded dementia early planning workshop series which currently puts out 250,000 annually, a dementia caregiver program for underserved populations, which puts out 475,000 annually, and a new caregiver portal that will be developed that has 3 million allocated one time. Next slide, please. So first up, we wanted to tell you about our community care program, which is a 1915C home and community-based waiver for the elderly. This is administered by the Illinois Department on Aging. The goal of the program is to assist older adults in maintaining their independence in the community so they can age in place. And we also know that it's cost-effective to provide alternatives to nursing home care or even just delay nursing home placement. In Illinois, um, as I just mentioned on the previous slide, approximately 1.45 billion goes out annually for this waiver program. It is a big program in Illinois. Currently, we have more than 131,000 residents enrolled in the CCP program. And the services offered under this waiver include four main areas, adult day services, in-home services, 
emergency home response services, and automated medication dispenser services. As many of us know, these core services are absolutely key, not only supporting our aging population at large to stay in the community, but they can be absolutely instrumental in supporting individuals living with dementia, their families, and their family caregivers. What makes what we think makes our CCP program stand out in Illinois is that the program is open to all who request services as long as they qualify functionally. So what that means is that there are eligibility requirements, as you can see on the slide, including having an assessed need for long-term care. However, both people with Medicaid and without Medicaid can end up receiving services under the program. So Medicaid eligibility and assets that are too low aren't barriers. The last piece that I want to mention about the Illinois CCP waiver is that a few years ago, Illinois began requiring dementia-specific training for any CCP direct service staff person in contact with persons living with dementia. Our Alzheimer's Association Illinois chapter did a really great job of working with our Illinois Department on Aging to develop this training in a meaningful way. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Jen Belko briefly with the Alzheimer's Association to talk about a bit of the funding that goes out through our triple A's. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jessica. Hi there. Um, this is a much smaller program than the CCP program, um, but it's interesting because um, it was legislation that was passed back in 2004, um, but it actually wasn't funded until recently, a couple of years ago. Um, and it was led by the triple A's um, it, it's it's a state formula um, for how they dispense the the uh, dollars, um, but it goes towards education, training, and respite. And then you'll see those are the eleven service areas um, that will get the, the dollars. Um, and they they don't all have to use the money the same way. Um, each AAA gets to decide. Um, who's eligible for the programs based on the type of program they think is most needed in their area. So something in Chicago may be very different than in Southern Illinois. And so th they have very different programs based on need, which we think is really interesting. Um, it started off with $4 million in the budget. And we know that's not a huge amount, but it's a start. Um, and it, it moved up the last two years has been have been $5 million, And I believe they'll be asking uh, for more in the future. So that's one of the the interesting new programs that we have that we think we'll see a lot of growth in. Uh, I'll hand it back to Jessica. Thanks, Jen. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to shift into our state funded programs. A little bit of background about state funding um, out of Illinois DPH. We receive general revenue funds for dementia programming specifically, which was in part due to the great advocacy efforts here. These funds almost exclusively go out under Illinois' competitive procurement process. And so at the beginning, when we started receiving the general revenue funds and a full-time dementia coordinator came on board, our approach was to work with our Alzheimer's Disease Advisory Committee using the state plan as guidance to prioritize where the funds would go. So we began with some early detection work, a project educating family physicians, and then also training and mobilizing trusted partners to provide public awareness education. I'm gonna fast forward now in the essence of time to tell you about two new state programs that the Illinois Department of Public Health Dementia Program currently oversees. The first is our Dementia Early Planning Workshop Series. So as we thought about the new state plan, and how we really wove caregivers throughout the entire plan. And we said, okay, we're just gonna dive in. So the first project that we did started in fiscal year 24. And from the state plan, we are aiming to provide high quality advanced care planning workshops that are also culturally tailored for specific target communities in Illinois. And this includes our caregivers and families in black American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian American and LGBTQ plus communities. The program aligns with two of the goals in the state plan. And when developing the program, what we found is that there is a lot of online information and even in-person workshops occurring, but there were three gaps that we identified. The first, learning about the documents such as living wills and powers of attorney isn't necessarily enough, especially for caregivers who are totally overwhelmed and busy. It doesn't always equate to getting the plan signed and in place. Number two, 
a lot of the curricula isn't tailored to communities in a way that is culturally relatable or accessible. Number three, we needed to mobilize partners who are able to reach not only those target populations in a culturally meaningful way, but who could also reach the individuals and families in communities who are living with dementia, ideally early enough to be able to put their wishes in place ethically. So really uh, the ideal outcome that we have for this program is to not only increase knowledge about the process for advanced care planning, but to really link the targeted audiences back to the free legal and or case management services needed to get the plans in place. So again, this program started in fiscal year 24. We're pretty early in the process. We have 250K total general revenue funds going out and it started with a three-year competitive bidding cycle. Our first two grantees are a community-based organization called Hanul Family Alliance, serving the Korean American population in Chicago, and the Center for Disability and Elder Law, a nonprofit legal organization specializing in providing free legal services to low-income seniors and people with disabilities in Chicago land. So first up, Hanul. Hanul has a robust case management team already very experienced with reaching their Korean American communities. So their project for this is gonna focus on providing legal education and linkage to their population. The financial and advanced directive workshops thus far have been very well received. And the people who attend those will be referred to a pro bono law firm to complete the legal documents if needed and wanted. Our second grantee, the Center for Disability and Elder Laws project is focused on developing and delivering three new culturally affirming and responsive legal work workshops for Black American, Hispanic Latinx, and LGBTQ plus communities. Additionally, they will develop some online video content and they will expand access to the workshops themselves through a partnership with an online e Illinois legal aid platform. And they're also gonna scale up by mobilizing other legal partners downstate. In summary, the first year of this grant was largely a planning year with both grantees developing culturally adapted modules and recruitment of participants. Year two started August 1st, and we are really looking forward to the numbers of people living with dementia who have completed those documents. Next slide, please. The second newly funded state program that I'm going to tell you about is the Dementia Caregiver Program for Underserved Populations. This program is a multi-pronged program aimed at providing education, support, and community connection for caregivers specifically in Black American, Latino, Hispanic, Asian American, and rural communities in Illinois. This too began in fiscal year 24 and is utilizing 475K to start off in state general revenue funds. It aligns with several areas in our current state plan, as well as Action E7 from the 2023 to 27 Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap, which is to ensure caregivers have information, tools, and resources about their vital role and ways to maintain their own health and well being. So we really went for it with this program. We really wanted it to address different angles of caregiver needs. And Carter was talking about some of these, but really equipping caregivers with the tools that they need to care, supporting their mental and emotional health, and then trying to reduce the isolation that they experience by giving them meaningful community connections. Um, also of note is that prior to planning this program, we had many conversations with our Illinois Department on Aging to ensure that we weren't duplicating the efforts of the AAAs or the Older American Act dollars, but rather complementing the efforts already in place in the aging network, and then filling gaps where needed. One way we are filling a gap is that this program specifically targets the unique needs that diverse and underserved caregivers of people living with dementia are facing with wraparound strategies. So five total grantees were chosen for this first cohort. Three of the five are providing evidence-based or evidence-informed interventions, but equally, if not more important, all five are providing culturally tailored and relevant interventions that wrap around the caregivers. So now I will briefly tell you about our five grantees and their interventions before turning it back over to Jen. Next slide, please. 
Our first partner that we chose to mobilize is the Illinois Public Health Association. They had some experience in our prior early detection work and really core to their intervention is training and mobilizing community health workers as trusted partners to provide the caregiver interventions in Black, Hispanic, and Asian American communities. This will include caregiver support groups and memory cafes. The CHWs in the program are employed by the Illinois Public Health Association's partners, which are community-based organizations skilled in working with and reaching the target communities. Next slide, please. Our second partner is the Chinese American Service League, also known as CASEL. They are a community-based nonprofit that is focusing on Chinese limited English-speaking communities in Chicago. They too will be mobilizing an evidence-based stress busting program that will be linguistically adapted for their Chinese communities, which we know is no easy feat. They will also do quarterly memory cafes, adapting them to be culturally relatable. And then all of this will be supplemented with individualized consultation and case management for those that need follow-up from the above interventions. Next slide, please. Our third partner is the University of Illinois at Chicago's College of Applied Health Sciences. The goal of UIC's Peace of Mind program is to serve diverse caregivers, including African Americans, Southeast Asian, and South Asian Americans. The UIC's team will be focusing on a core educational curriculum, a framework for cultural adaptation of the curriculum and its delivery, and a directory of community resources for each of the targeted communities. All materials will be translated for each target community, again, not an easy feat. And then lastly, they will be providing social gatherings at partner sites in the communities, again, culturally adapted to be comfortable and relevant. Next slide, please. Our fourth partner is Shawnee Health Service and Development Corporation. They are a, qual a federally qualified health center with many programs, including a care coordination unit. They will be reaching the lower 18 counties of Illinois, which is largely rural. And Shawnee will be providing both the evidence-based savvy caregiver and memory cafe programs with rural adapt adaptations. Shawnee has a very large network of partners in Southern Illinois that they are able to leverage to make adjustments. And we really look forward to learning more from them about effective ways to increase access and support to the caregivers in our rural areas. Next slide, please. Our fifth and final partner for our first cohort of this program is Moultrie County Health Department. They are a local health department in Central Illinois that serves largely rural communities. And they plan to use traditional public health approaches for this program, including dementia public education and awareness presentations, including dementia friendly talks, professional partnership development, and a comprehensive caregiver wellness program. So as you can see, this is a multi-sector group of grantees serving very specific diverse and underserved populations. Each grantee has some similarities in their strategies per the NOFO requirements, but they're also very unique in their approach. And they are very intentional in how they are culturally adapting the programs for the specific communities. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jen to quickly talk about our last project, which is a new project in the works. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jessica. Um, this last slide is about a brand new initiative. It was a piece of legislation that AARP ran during the last session that actually did not pass. Um, but we we had a budget um, and then we have something called a BIMP, which is like our um, omnibus after the budget. And they were able to get some money um, into that budget to start this program. Um, so it was an innovative way to handle not being able to get it across the um, the line uh, legislatively this year. Um, so it was $3 million and it, this is a unique portal only because it's it's for all caregivers. It's going to be housed at the Department on Aging um, and it's for, for everyone 60 plus um, because of the aging target, but any, any caregivers um, can find resources there. Um, <clears throat> I think some of the biggest things that are cool about this is that there's uh, private and public resources available. Um, and there's an opportunity because this is just starting out, there's an opportunity for the association and other supporters 
um, to collaborate and help guide the development and implementation um, and the procedures for how we'll keep this up to date. The Department on Aging has committed the one-time $3 million um, uh, commitment, but the Department on Aging has committed to keeping it up to date. So we're all going to work in a partnership together to make sure that all of the, in the information is current and important for all caregivers. And now I think I'm going to pass it over to Carter, correct? Thank you, Jen and Jessica, for um, talking about all the good work that's going on in Illinois. And I now would like to turn it over to Katie to talk about the program in New York. Thank you, Carter, and thank you for joining everyone. I appreciate um, being invited today to give you a little bit of information about what New York is doing currently. So we look forward to sharing our successful approaches that we have had so far. Um, we're going to discuss, uh, I'll, I will provide an overview of the services and supports that are available currently in New York through a comp comprehensive Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative, as well as explain a little bit more about the infrastructure um, in New York that started in 1988. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so just to, I didn't include this slide in here in the interest of time, but just to give a little bit of more of a background here. Um, in 2007, the Coordinating Council for Alzheimer's related to Alzheimer's disease and other de related dementias was initiated. And the Alzheimer's Community Assistance Program was then modified to ensure a statewide effort in 2008, with the first report from the New York State Coordinating Council for Alzheimer's being released in 2009. In 2015, that's when everything really big started in New York, where, when we received $25 million for a public health response to Alzheimer's disease. So to get in, involved in talking about our program, we wanted to give you a little bit of a background about the data in New York. So currently 426,500 New Yorkers are over 65 with Alzheimer's disease, which is 12.7% um, for that age group. And we should note that the Bronx, which is in New York City, is within the top 10 in the country of population for um, with the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's disease of, of, with residents of, with African-American Hispanic descent. Let's see. As some of you know, New York has a robust Medicaid program, and in 2020, the cost of Medicaid care for someone with Alzheimer's disease was just under $5.5 billion, and this is expected to increase over 15% by next year, and the Alzheimer's disease services will be discussed later, in particular interest to the cost of the population. Uh, next slide, please. So to discuss a little bit more about New York, in the caregiving role, over 543,000 New Yorkers are in a caregiving role at this point, with over 60% reporting having chronic health conditions and a quarter or 24.7% reporting having depression, and 12% consider themselves in poor physical health. These caregivers are providing more than 879 million hours of unpaid care, which is equivalent to just under 19 billion in unpaid care. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we'll um, go over a little bit of the history and organizational structure of the New York State Alzheimer's Disease Program. We're currently positioned within the New York State Department of Health Office for Aging and Long-Term Care under the Center for Home and Community-Based Services. And our strategic guidance is provided for by the New York State Coordinating Council Services to the Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, the coordinating council, which hold meetings quarterly and then communicate um, throughout the year as well in regards to recommendations for Alzheimer's care. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we will provide a little bit more of a breakdown of the Alzheimer's disease community caregiver support initiative, which was established in 2015 and this initiative was based off an evidence-based evidence replication of Mary Middleman's work from 2006. New York sought to establish an array of services, starting with expanding the already existing Alzheimer's Disease Assistance Centers, formerly known as the ADACs, 
which were rebranded to the Centers of Excellence to support early detection diagnosis, then ensuring that there are evidence-based services in community at a local level to support caregiver needs. Next slide, please. So you'll see a breakdown on this slide as to how the services go all throughout New York State. Our goal is to support all 62 counties in New York State. And when the, when the 25 million investment to community support began in 2015, we determined it was best to break it out in regions to make sure that every region and every county was reached for New York State. So all of the region, um, each individual region had um, organizations that were able to apply uh, as the boots on the grounds, so those providers that knew their regions and the populations that they served best. These contractors do the work of the local of the department at a local level. The map shows the eight caregiver support initiative regions in four subregions in New York City. <clears throat> New York City was divided into smaller subregions and we have one contractor for each subregion. When thinking about New York, a lot of folks do just think about New York City. But if you look, most of the state is not New York City. It is a very small amount. And um, many folks consider all of that upstate. So most of the map, dark green and above, represents those upstate regions of New York, which makes up the rural communities. And at times is where we see a lot of those shortage areas for care. Next slide, please. So when looking at where we needed support in New York, we looked at both community support and education and the importance of diagnosis and professional training. So community support and education was intended to enhance the quality of life for individuals with ADRD and their caregivers to decrease that caregiver burden. But in order to get there, we first had to make sure that New York was able to get to that early diagnosis. So then we looked at the diagnos diagnostics and professional training, which is intended to maximize medical training and the advanced care planning an early and accurate diagnosis, allowing for determination of and respect for the patient's treatment preferences and financial wishes. So there, so though the caregiver support programs provide a lot of that social work support, it often starts at the Centers for Excellence level where a lot of that social work support is initiated, making sure those folks have power of attorneys, healthcare proxies, and then are referred out to the programs to continue to get further care. We did initially start a caregiver support initiative for the underserved communities, as you'll see in yellow here. Uh, through time, we unfortunately saw that it was not able to be as successful as New York had hoped it was. We weren't able to quite get the reach that we were hoping to get with the limited amount, limited amount of funds that were given to those underserved support initiatives. So that was moved into just the regional caregiver support initiative to reach that underserved those underserved communities as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the goals of the Alzheimer's Disease Support Initiative were to delay nursing home placement, improve health quality of life and care for both individuals living with ADRD and their caregivers, help to avoid unnecessary hospitalizations and emergency department visits, increase ability to maintain individuals living with ADRD in the community, and support dementia-friendly communities. The goals continue to expand the safety net for caregivers of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias by recognizing and addressing the need for caregiver support services and addressing caregiver stress. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we'll go over um, the program components for the Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative. Next slide. Thank you. So the first step is the Alzheimer's uh, uh, the Centers of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease. So there are 10 throughout the state and they're the regional experts in detection, diagnosis and treatment for Alzheimer's disease and re related dementia. They're positioned to offer comprehensive interdisciplinary diagnostic assessments, expand the workforce capacity by training medical and health professionals and students regarding early detection, diagnosis and treatment, and educate the community on the importance of early detection, annual wellness visits, and addressing cognitive changes with their provider. Next slide, please. 
The Alzheimer's Disease Community Assistance Program is a statewide effort that's contracted through the Coalition of New York State's Alzheimer's Association chapters. And those services include care consultations, caregiver education and training, support groups, 24-hour helpline available in more than 20, uh, 200 languages, excuse me, community education, awareness and outreach, training for important constituencies such as professional caregivers, faith leaders, and gatekeepers. Bill, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Uh, yes, Katie. The The ASCAP grant uh, allows the Alzheimer's Association as the contractor uh, of this large program to truly become a partner with New York State and the Department of Health, um, where we start rowing in the same direction because we are providing these robust services on the ground in all 62 counties. Uh, that means, one, that the Alzheimer's Association in New York really has a large programmatic staff in all of our seven chapters um, to provide the reach necessary to, to hit that almost 450,000 New Yorkers living with this disease uh, and their caregivers. So our, our reach is greater, um, but in, in terms of relationship building between the association and the state, uh, we talk constantly, it allows for growth there, but also as Katie indicated, we have a coordinating council. That means the Alzheimer's Association has a seat at that council and we can bring the caregiver perspective to the statewide council and say from the on the ground in the field, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're hearing from people coming to us through this grant program. We are able to carry that message up to the decision makers in Albany uh, with truly what is happening, what the caregivers need uh, and how the state can best address it. Thank you, Bill. Next slide, please. And then we have the regional caregiver support initiatives. And we have 11 regional caregiver support initiatives throughout the state. And those contractors provide evidence-based, evidence-informed and proven strategies in the implementation of the core caregiving support services within every county of New York State. And this includes caregiver assessments, outreach to and engagement with underserved communities, caregiver education, caregiver support and engagement activities, support groups, joint enrichment activities or caregiver wellness programs. Those may include memory cafes, coffee clutches, things like that, respite services and optional innovative access or other services. Times those innovative services may include um, wander guard systems of alike, those GPS systems. We have a few other folks um, throughout the state working on some different innovative programs as they continue to grow. Next slide, please. So a little breakdown of the services provided in the, in the first cycle from 2016 to 2022, we had 61 over 61,000 diagnostic assessments completed with over 200,000 referrals to community providers. 292,000 consultations to get to continue those community services for caregivers with serving over 21,000 support group sessions and more than 12,500 educational opportunities, um, as well as 752,000 hours of respite care, really decreasing that risk of um, needing an early admission into a nursing home and keeping that risk of burden down, hopefully having extra support. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to give a little bit of a background as to when we did surveys of the folks that were utilizing the services in New York State, this slide just provides a little bit of information. Um, and to note, 35% of the caregivers were working full-time. And as we know, a lot of those full-time working caregivers do lose out on a lot of their work time, run the risk of having to take unpaid time in order to care for their loved one, that person living with dementia. And as was noted earlier, 48.8% earned less than 50000 a year. Uh, in interest of time, we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So the online service was conducted among um, the caregivers that participated in 2019, uh, you know, only over less than 2,000 caregivers responded to it, but it was still helpful to get a little bit more information um, for who the caregivers were. So 44% were caring for a parent, 43.6% were caring for a spouse or a partner, 
Uh, 44.3% were providing 40 hours or more of unpaid care per week. And 62.3% were providing care for someone with a middle or moderate stage dementia. Next slide, please. And to give you a little bit of background as to what people saw were the big differences in utilizing services from the caregiver support initiatives. We have some statistics here as to how they responded. So a lot of folks felt that they benefited from having improved knowledge about diagnosis and ADRD, about caregiver and dementia related resources and about their caregiving role. And what we see a lot within the state and when we talk to folks um, that are with our different organizations is just that caregivers are feeling heard and supported and knowing they're not alone in dealing with this. So until they meet other caregivers and, and meet the social workers and the other care managers and um, folks that are within the organizations, they're feeling alone. So having the benefit of meeting someone and getting that care um, and support I think there's much more of an understanding and appreciation there. Next slide, please. So this just gives a little bit more of a information of the benefits as the caregivers, as caregivers used one or more different services, the number of benefits they identified increased. So the support groups and the joint enrichment and the respite, the more that they were able to take advantage of with the programs that were provided, the services that were provided the more benefits they saw in that. Next slide, please. And as you'll see in this slide, respondents who participated in each of the core services reported greater averages and decrease of burden than caregivers who did not use that service, decreasing um, that early admission into nursing home placements. So that is beneficial to see. Okay, next slide, please. And this just gives a, um, we provided a link for New York State so you can get more information in regards to what our services per, uh, are provided in New York. So you can certainly click on that link anytime and it provides the information for all of the contractors that we have under our caregiver support initiative, as well as other educational opportunities that have been completed in New York State and information on our coordinating council as well. Next slide, please. And thank you. That is my contact information as well. Feel free to reach out to me directly or to our Alzheimer's disease program mailbox with any questions as well. Thank you, Katie. Um, I would like to remind everyone, if you have questions related to uh, Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving, to please go ahead and submit that into the uh, question and answer portal. Um, we have about seven minutes uh, remaining, so we will get through as many questions as possible. Um, and I'm going to call on um, members of the panel to answer some of these. I think the first question, and I will um, see perhaps um, if Jessica and Jen uh, might feel comfortable answering this one, but it is, what is the most helpful in developing meaningful local relationships with each state's politicians where these programs are active. Jen, that one's yours. I had a feeling. Um, I, I think it depends on the issue. And I think it, um, it depends on, on, on what you're trying uh, to accomplish. Different legislators are, you go to for different things, but obviously the ones that have a personal connection um, are, are always going to be helpful because they understand the disease um, uh, and they bring a level of compassion um, to the issue. Um, obviously, members that are in leadership are going to um, have the capacity to get things done quicker. Um, but oftentimes it's working with um, departments of the administration before um, before you even deal with the legislature or around the legislature and, and not necessarily doing it through law. Um, Jessica has come up with a lot of these programs um, without having to, to some of the, the things that she's funded never went through um, actual legislative, the legislative process. So we need, we need elected officials to help for a bunch of different things, but not for every program that we want to work on. Thank you, Jen. 
Um, I have a couple of specific questions for states and I will see if we have that information. If not, then we might be able to, to get back to you um, following this webinar. But there was a question, uh, Katie and Bill, about New York and the 61,000 diagnostic um, assessments and who was conducting or the qualifications of the individuals that were conducting those assessments. So the 61,000, the data for the 61,000 was from our 10 centers of excellence. So it's it that number is strictly from the centers of excellence for Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, and Jessica and Jen, um, there are a couple of questions here about the resource, the Caregiver Resource um, Center. Um, do we, is there a name of the portal um, for Illinois at this point? And you know, is it up and running or is it still in development? No, so I, I actually made a mistake. So the the legislation um, that that created the program that develops the portal was passed in that BIMP that I talked about, but the $3 million request for appropriations was not in that. So I apologize for that. That's being worked on right now. And as soon as that's up and running, it's a small amount of money. So I don't think it's going to take very long um, to get that going. But um, my understanding is that the name um, and the URL will be um, released at the same time along with um, once they, they actually have it up and running and, and um, able to, to share with the public. So Thank you. Thank you, Jen. We'll put that in the coming soon category. Um, uh, also for New York, um, there was a question about uh, the funding for the regional centers of excellence. And I know this is a very complicated um, uh, answer to this question. So um, Bill, I don't know if you and Katie want to sort of give it in a nutshell about um, about how that's funded. So that's funded under part of the 25 million um, and the centers of excellence for annually for the 10 centers is uh, it's 470,000 per year for each center at this time. Katie? And I think it's important to note too, Katie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the 10 centers, to put this in perspective, are large research hospital institutions across the state of New York. Um, so there are there's several downstate, and then as you move upstate, there are, uh, like I live in Albany, Albany Medical Center is the center of excellence for the capital region of New York. So these are the yes, large. That, that certainly is good to mention, Builds. They're certainly not, they're not standalone locations. So they're typically organizations that have an educational component with it. So um, folks might be familiar with Columbia University or NYU. Those are some of the folks that are funded that are more widely known um, nationally. That so a small a smaller amount of funding comes from New York State, and then of course they you know are funded as an organization as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, from an individual who is a tribal me member, Shawnee and are asking about any um, Native American specific resources that might be available as part of these programs in the States. I think we at Carter, we have states that, that have much more tribal, stronger tribal communities that would probably be able to share more information. We don't in Illinois. I don't know about it in New York. We don't have, um, I don't believe a whole lot of specific information at this time. Uh, there are states that have a little more of a robust outreach at this point. Yeah, Wisconsin comes to mind um, with their uh, dementia um, program that operates there um, in the tribal communities. Uh, so with that, I apologize if I did not get to your question, but uh, I'm afraid we have um, run out of time. Um, Elma, I'm going to turn it over to you for the um, closing about the uh, survey. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I wish we had a few more minutes, but we want to, as Carter said, be respectful of your time. Thank you all for being here today. Related to this last question about uh, resources for collaborations with tribal um 
communities and health uh, agencies, perhaps a resource to check is the iasquared.org. They are a member of our HBI collaborative. I am um, putting the link to their website on here in the chat. Um, thank you for being here today. As you exit Zoom, you will get an invitation to uh, respond to a brief survey. Thank you for the feedback. We really take it seriously and we listen to you and use it to inform our future programming. This was really a great session and I hope we can build on this topic of state policies to support dementia caregivers in the future. Carter, thank you so much um, to you, to your team for helping us plan this um, event today and to our teams in Illinois and New York for being here. Thank you. <laughs>